Thanks very much. I, uh, we, we appreciate being here. We appreciate all of you. I know that the Rotary is a service organization and quite honestly if there's a time that uh, support of our communities is needed it's very much now. Uh, I also want to introduce uh, who's also with me is Jackie Behrens who's an intern with us for the summer. I'll speak more about her background a little bit later but she has put to help me put together all the things that you'll see. What we thought we'd do is we touch on three topics, who we are, a little bit about the farm, what we do, and why what, doing what we do, uh, we feel is quite important, especially now. So Asgard Farms, many of you may know it, and many of you hopefully have been here. It was owned by Rockwell Kent. Uh, he was here from 1927 until the, he passed away in 1971. You'll see it, you saw a quote on the, the uh, first page that we had. Quite honestly, this was in his autobiography. He spoke about driving over the, the rise when he looked onto Asgard, and this was a feeling that he had. And then we have to say that this was exactly the feeling that Rhonda and I had when we first drove over the ridge and looked down on Asgard. Asgard Farm, it means home of the gods in North mythology. It was his home. Uh, needless to say, he was a larger than life figure. I think an English major would call him uh, Protean. He was an artist. He was an illustrator. He was an author. He was a cartoonist. He was an advertising artist. He did quite a bit of commercial art. Uh, he was an explorer. He was a Columbia trained architect. He was a political activist. And importantly for us, he was a farmer. His home at Asgard was called Gladsheim, which is the home of the king, a mythological king of the gods. And so few uh, accused Kent of excessive uh, modesty. It was a prominent dairy in the 30s to the 60s with a registered herd of uh, Jersey cows he had. That was the center of his business. And he was a local farm, just like we are, producing a range of dairy products for local consumption. Quite famously, uh, Kent gave the dairy to two of its four operators uh, in the wake of the uh, McCarthy hearings in the late 19, well, the, the House on Un-American Activities, which was followed by the McCarthy hearings. He was quite a controversial person and his business uh, started to fail and he gave it to two of the four operators, the two that uh, agreed with his politics. Uh, years later, he would give all of the rest of the farm, the farmhouse, all the farm buildings and half the land to Tink and Gladys Emerson. You'll see in these pictures, I think this is Tink Emerson in one of the photographs. Um, and that's the part of the farm that we bought first in 1988. So we take our stewardship of this place pretty seriously. It's got a long history. Uh, we're still known as the, or we were known for years, it's a nice young couple that bought the Kent farm. We arrived in 1988. We just wanted a farm really. The Adirondacks became our home. Our family was here. My sister Brenda Cotton and Rich and my mother moved up here. Asgard had lain dormant for quite a long time before we got here, probably from the 60s to the late 80s. And it was essentially a fixer-upper, you can see in these photographs. This is what we found when we arrived at Asgard. Uh, Phil Thayer showed us this property, actually, and Howard Riley uh, brought us over here. And uh, he admitted that no one else had gotten out of the car. Uh, it needed a lot of work, but we had a lot of time. Ron and I had jobs in New York City. We were raising our daughter. And we spent the better part of 15, maybe 20 years uh, with a long series of projects to restore what was here and begin to think about what we would do with the place. So that turns us to what did we or what did we want to do with it. Uh, I'll speak a little bit about uh, our business. We're a mission-driven company. In the intervening years, uh, during this period, we added to a successive tracts of land around uh, Asgard. We first we reassembled the original uh, property, which was about 300, 300 acres when Kent was here. That's the property on the left, and we added adjacent properties uh, as they came up. You know, quite honestly, uh, with the land values here during this time uh, made it possible to do. Today, Asgard is about fifteen hundred acres, uh, including the Kent property and adjoining property. 
recently, in our early this year, we were finally, uh, after years of working on that, we were, the, the property was listed on the National Register, which is something that uh, was very important uh, to to us, part of our stewardship here. So the business, at the heart of our business, uh, well, we're a local farm, just like, uh, just like Rockwell Kent was. This is our mission. You know, these mission statements tend to look the same, uh, but I'd like to spend a, just a minute talking about what are the elements of this that are important to us. The first and foremost, we wanted to create a distinct artisanal dairy product, and then we focused on goat dairy, and we make seven kinds of cheese from goats. We've studied cheese making. We've uh, we focused on it over now 10 years. The dairy started in 2008. Um, we've even won some awards. But at the, at the end of the day, we're still a local dairy and servicing our local community. We also have heritage livestock around that. We, uh, good stewards, what does that mean for us? Well, we look at our profit of this place, not only in financial terms, but also in terms of what we can do for our people and for the environment. We have a carbon neutral objective now that we just moved to 2025, and I'm quite sure that we'll, we'll get there. Farming's no picnic. It's not real easy to make uh, money doing this type of activity. You should all probably know that already. Um, but you know, they say uh, no margin, no mission. So we feel it's a, a key part of our objective to, to show that this kind of farming can sustain itself financially. And the last comment on the mission uh, where we have uh, under good citizens, the most important part of our mission is people and the training of new farmers. And we do that in three ways. Uh, one is our in our intern program, probably we counted up 50 people have come through Asgard in the past 15 years, helping us, working with us, many as interns, some as apprentices, and some as longer term workers. Some have gone on to start their own forums like Blue Pepper Farm uh, and Oregano Flats. Uh, the second thing that we do is we have an incubator here at Asgard. We offer the facility to people starting new businesses. That was the way Blue Pepper was started. They started making yogurt here. And today we have a young woman by the name of Kelsey Mian who's making butter, gold bar butter. So if you see these products, uh, please support them. And the other thing that we do is we try to mentor anyone and anyone who comes along that has an interest in farming. Uh, and that extends to Kenya. In fact, I'm a mentor to a fellow by the name of Kevin Udami, who has a small goat dairy, which is servicing uh, his community, which is deep in, a, it's in Mathar, it's deep in the uh, slums of Nairobi, Kenya. So what do we do? As I said earlier, we're a local farm, and at the heart of that is a goat dairy. We make seven kinds of cheese. We started by making it in the kitchen. We've gone to schools and classes and developed uh, our products over the years to the extent that we have now a nice diversified uh, product offering to make. Around that, we also have other things that help the farm work financially and it's good for lots of other reasons. We we have a cattle herd for beef. Bill Van Stockham, who built all the fence for us around here, he reminded me countless times, these cows are managing your grass. The beef is just a byproduct. So the cows are really here both to help us manage the soils and the pasture lands that we have, and he gives us another product. We also have pork. That fits really nicely with the other things that we do. Number one, we have gallons and gallons of whey that they drink. Uh, it's a great food for the pork. They live in uh, the summer here on our pastures and they basically uh, help also, like the cattle, restore the soils. And they even make silver pasture for us, which is wooded pasture areas. Around that, there's a couple of other activities. We, um, we have poultry. Again, we're on the pasture with poultry. It gives us another product. We can process on the farm a thousand birds without a specialized uh, license. And beyond that, we are selling uh, locally. Everything that we sell is to our community. 60% of what we sell goes through our store here and on, on the farmer's markets, and the rest goes to these types of stores. We provide housing. You know that housing is an issue, and we've taken the opportunity of the 
of adding properties to, to use the facilities we've gained. The one on the upper left was built by Kent for his son, Rocky. That's our farm stay. The one on the lower right we use as an intern house. The one on the upper right we rent to a local couple that frankly needs a nice place to stay at a reasonable uh, rent. And the one on the upper right was actually a cabin built by Senator Stafford when he owned the property briefly. And that's occupied by a crew that's working on the trail system up here. We also do some logging. Those go to the local mills and it helps us to manage properly the around a thousand acres of forest property. Finally, we, we invest. We, you know, Rhonda and I've been lucky enough over the years to accumulate enough savings to, to go into our retirement. And we've made a decision a couple of years ago to, to move some of these, uh, our savings, if you will, into things that are going to affect uh, our area locally. And these are examples of the types of investment we've made through Point Positive. I don't know if you know about Point Positive, but it's a fabulous organization which assists small businesses in our region uh, get started. And uh, we participate in that and have participated in, uh, in a number of these startup companies. I would call it pre-angel financing. Uh, the one on the lower left, I would just point out, uh, that's ducted wind turbines. This is a fabulous invention. It will produce power for small-scale wind generation on a price that is competitive with solar, which has been a challenge for the small wind industry. We're going to have the first such uh, installation here at Asgard. We're hoping within sometime uh, within June or July, it will not only be a uh, uh, sensible investment but will also uh, prove to be a game changer in this uh, in this field of alternative energy. People ask us all the time, why do you do what you do? And uh, part of the reason, or a big part of the reason of why we do what we do is is that uh, are these three reasons. We think it's good. It's good food can be produced on these small, small farms. It's good for the local economy and it's good for our environment. On the first point, I show these two graphs. They're, I'm not a doctor. I'm not a, uh, have any medical training and I'm not even a statistician, but these two graphs are quite commonly used to illustrate what's happened over the 20th century. Food price as a cost of food to households as a percentage of disposable income has collapsed from 18% to less than 6%. And during the same time, the incidence of uh, I would say uh, the types of, of uh, this is a graph of diabetes, but these types of conditions has grown. As I say, I'm not a statistician or a physician, but the correlation is, is uh, eerie. The quote at the bottom is from Wendell Berry, who's a philosopher and writer, Kentucky farmer. He said, people are fed by a food industry which pays no attention to health and are treated by a health industry which pays no attention to food. That's changing. It's starting to change. One, the pharmacy project I would just point out in Keysville is a good example of that where we have local foods inside the, the Keysville pharmacy. Dan Bosley has been a real pioneer working with ADK Action. And quite honestly, the interns that we have this year are just evidence, further evidence to Rhonda and me about why and how this will change. Jackie was studying to be in nursing. And she came to us for the summer to, to try and solve the problem differently. Our other intern, Morgan Long, was actually studying as a nutritionist. She's from Oklahoma. And she came with the same objectives in mind. So I, we are hopeful that with the new generation of, of farmers, that the, the appreciation for what kind of food can be built and grown on these farms will change. Does farming work or is it good for our common economy? And I always love this quote from Michael Pollan who wrote The Omnivore's Dilemma. He said, essentially we have a system where the wealthy farmers feed the poor crap and poor farmers feed the wealthy high quality food. I've always resisted this definition of what we do as being a product for people who have means. Uh, I can tell you that our objective is to feed our community and that makes a lot of sense uh, because the food that is here should stay here 
and the food dollars will circulate in our local economy. So we are determined, along with many, many other new emerging farms, to prove that this can work and it should work. Um, the last point is it's good for our environment. I gave a speech a couple of years ago to the Adirondack Council and I said, I hope this is an easy conversation because you should all appreciate, but I'll use this slide to make one comment. There's a lot of talk about beef and why beef is bad for the environment, it's bad for your health. Well, without going into a lot of the arguments uh, as to why I would simply make the point and invite you to spend time thinking about this. Grass-fed beef is proven to be a healthier, it's leaner, it's got more protein, it's a good product to consume. And cows, I have to say, are very, very special animals because what they can do is they can produce high quality food from plants that we can't eat. In other words, they can digest grasses, a wide range of grasses that humans can't consume and turn it into a good product. While they're doing that, they're actually helping us manage a climate sink because they're helping us by being properly grazed, as you can see in this picture. They're basically allowing these plants to grow with roots deep into the soil sequestering, taking CO2 out of the environment, and at the same time putting oxygen back. So I would spend a whole talk on why this is important. The only other comment I'll make about this is that grass-fed beef is a very nice product and it's very rare. Less than 5% of the beef you can find in the US is in fact grass-fed and grass-finished. And 70% of that comes from Australia and Argentina. So when you're thinking about this product, you should, you should consider that we, we're having a growing number of sources of really grass-fed beef here in the Adirondacks as our farming community has grown over the past 10 years. <clears throat> I'm conscious of time, so I'll move along. I'd like to close with one, the, some comments uh, Randy had asked about the, uh, what's the current situation in uh, in farming uh, with the COVID-19 situation. I, um, I'm convinced that a book is gonna be written about this and the title is gonna be something like The Great Pivot, The Response of Small Farms to the Pandemic of 2020. On the left, you can see the effect of the pandemic on us and you can take us as an example of every single small farm in the North Country. Um, over this time, on March 16th, which is the date we all target this uh, beginning of uh, the impact on our businesses, overnight, as you all know, we lost over 50% of our wholesale customers with the closure of restaurants. And frankly, the sad loss of employment by many, many of our good friends in the hospitality sector. We immediately had to cancel two of our three major events. We had two kidding days. Uh, and we're still talking about whether the cheese tour will take place. We've uh, put on hold uh, our rental of our rental or seasonal rental units. We're not expecting many of the camps and seasonal residents to emerge. So it was a bit of a crisis from a business standpoint. I estimated losses of revenues between 30 and 50%. Uh, I'm glad to say that I'm at the lower end of that now. Um, I had to say the response uh, of the farming community, oh, well, I would put it this way, it was all we could do to keep up with the energy, the action, and the momentum created by the many, many new young, many young farmers that have emerged in our community over the past 10 years. Everybody decided to operate as essential businesses, making and remaking new protocols every day. We basically, organized a reopening plan before we could reopen. And uh, we worried, we worried that we would get sick, who would milk our animals and the farming community. You saw emails floating around this community saying, if anyone needs it, I know how to milk cows. If anyone needs it, I know how to make this. We set up online stores overnight because we really needed to do something to get food to people efficiently and safely. We established curbside pickups. Um, in fact, you can go to the next 
slide, Jackie, uh, Jackie, because you'll see some pictures of these things. On the left is a picture of the curbside pickup. We were in the Saranac Hotel over the winter as a farmer's market. When they closed, we had to move outside. Uh, and the Osable Valley Grange, who runs your market in Lake Placid now and the one in Saranac Lake, immediately organized a curbside pickup. We went from having 15 customers a week during the winter time to over 200 cars passed by this park at, in two hours on the Saturdays in April. So what was clear was that number one, the farming community could respond and two, there was a huge demand for food. I think people didn't want to go to the grocery stores to be going honest. We planned for the worst. I drove down to Albany and picked up uh, almost a ton of beef we had in storage. Uh, things like ground beef became popular products because, again, people didn't want to go to the grocery stores. We diversified our suppliers. We worried about wh where we bought grain, where we went to the butcher. We have now three butchers that we can access. And finally, um, you know, many of the farms increased food production. Uh, and all the while, there were absolutely no mention of any price increases by any of these small farms. Uh, at the same time already operating on slim margins. Some of the farms, Essex Farm and Fledging Crow, they committed to supporting New York City, quite honestly. Fledging Crow was running down to New York City a couple times a week. We supported restaurants that decided to stay open, Baxter Mountain. A couple of businesses started up, River Goose and Osable Forks and Red Oak Food Company was set up in a matter of weeks by a young fellow, uh, Jordan Sauter, that uh, lost his job in the hospitality industry. Uh, and at the same time, these same farms were committing substantial resources to getting food to people who had lost their jobs and needed it. And I put on one of these slides, the emergency food basket program, which was organized by uh, the Hub on the Hill and ADK Action. They're delivering more than 200 emergency food packages a week. They've raised money to buy food from small farms, and many of these small farms are also donating food alongside the food that they're selling. The only comment that I'll make on the and what happened in the industrial food system, the impact on the industrial food system was a real drama. Supply chains were disrupted. They were unable to make the move from uh, institutional customers to retail customers as easily as small farms. Their working conditions were in large facilities and they were only exacerbated by the pandemic. The plant closure, I'll just use one example, one plant closure, pork processing plant in the Midwest uh, represented nearly 5% of the national production of pork in a single plant. So you can imagine the effect when a plant like that closes. Otherwise, we're seeing stories of euthanization of animals that can't be processed and, uh, and dumping of milk, even in, our own, even in our own region. So the concluding point on that is that the strength in the, of our local farming system that we have right here in our community is really an asset. And it's central to our quality of life and to our economy. And it's been able to stand up in this time. So that's pretty much all I had to say. I would offer the following uh, challenge in, in closing. And I don't mean to be presumptuous, but it's a challenge. Feed yourselves and your families for a month, just a month on only food and beverages that are grown and produced here in the North Country. You know, we, 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 <clears throat> we were concerned about making this slide because we're leaving so many of our friends out. But this is a selection of products from yogurt to cheeses to beef to uh, processed products to even spirits and beers. Um, and this is just a small sampling of what's available to you uh, here in this North Country. So that's the, the challenge. Uh, if you can even buy a CSA, uh, you know, what's a CSA? We, we used to think of CSA, it's community supported agriculture. Well, I think it's consumer supported agriculture. You know, all the small farms around here, including ours, will offer anywhere from 10 to 15% discount on food. And I don't know of grocery stores that 
do that. So that's what we would say in, uh, so that's, uh, that's what we would say in closing. Uh, we know that you're all big supporters, uh, I'm sure already of the farms, but I, I think if there's ever a time that it, uh, it should be highlighted, it's now, and I appreciate so much the opportunity to talk to you about it. David, is it possible to um, come and visit the farm now? Uh, in fact, yes. Uh, the way we've organized, uh, all of our products are online now. So everything is online order and online pay for curbside pickup. And in fact, we went from being open two days to being open six days, 12 to six, every day but Sunday. And so people can are welcome to come to the farm and pick up and walk around. Of course, we're quite sensitive to the numbers of people on the farm and, and all the protections uh, in our plan. But quite honestly, we have quite a bit of space. So if people are here for pickup and they want to take a walk around, we're quite open. I've got three grandchildren who would love to see the animals. Is that possible? Yeah, I, yes. I, you know, again, we, uh, we, uh, we, we've been torn between uh, being the welcoming place that we have tried to be in the past. You know, we had 5,000 visitors to Asgard last year between events and before but also being sensitive to the fact that we do have a small team around here and we have to be careful about the number of other people that are walking around at any given time. David, this, this is Randy. Could you talk, talk a little bit about some of your special events that you have had in the past? I guess they're all on hold right now, but they are some special events that hopefully we will get back to eventually where a lot of people do come to your farm. Yes, thanks. Thanks, Randy. Yes, we do two types of events, or three types actually. One, our biggest events are Kidding Day, it, which we do in March and April when we have all the kids, and you, you may have seen a couple of them running around, those are the last two. Um, and that's a great event. It got so big that we, we split it into two days, and that draws around 1,500 people. We do that normally the end of March and end of April. Um, and then together with Sugar House Creamery and North Country Creamery, we do, it will be our eighth year of the Essex County Cheese Tour. We were a bit pretentious maybe in assuming that name, but we are the only three cheesemakers in Essex County. And that occurs on Columbus Day weekend. It's also a great event, it's a big event. The other kind that we do is we always welcome a lot of nonprofit organizations who have their annual meetings here. In fact, we were scheduled to have ADK Action here in July, and that's been put on hold for the time being. And the third type of event is I'll call them private events or local. In fact, let's create another event right here. I would love to welcome you as a group to the farm at some point. We could pick up on any one of the topics we've touched on and, uh, and spend some time together. <coughs> That's very generous. Thank you. that will be wonderful. David, it's Harris. I mean, thanks for working with me and Jackie, too, to get this thing set up for you guys. I want to ask a question from the uh, article that Randy forwarded to us. From when you were in banking to now in agriculture, what translated from bank the banking industry to farming to help you get Asgard running with all the stuff you do? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, in fact, the, the, there's also another question, which I'll, I'll just put on the table. Probably the real question could be, what did I learn in farming as a child and a teenager that helped me in my banking career? <laughs> but the kinds of things that I found that were similar were, I, were risk management. You know, we, I worked in markets and, and I managed markets teams and we were very focused on managing risks, risks of everything. And in fact, uh, the pandemic is the kind of risk that we always worked on. And I was fortunate enough to live through, fortunate or at least opportune enough to live through a number of crises over the years. Um, but you know, the risk management in a small farm is as complicated, if not more complicated. So this whole idea of managing risk, managing your business by managing risks, uh, was a good, if you will, translating point, if you will. The risks are slightly different, but 
they're just as important, if not more important. David, this is Susan Friedman again. Um, if you could do something over again, I mean, you're, you're growing and you're, you're very successful at what you do, but what would you do differently if you could do it over again? Should I answer for me or for my for my partner and wife? <laughs> <laughs> However you want. <laughs> Most people think we're crazy, quite frankly. Uh, you know, and it, and and I, I say that half joking. Uh, you know, when this in March, we had a thought about just saying, why don't we just hang it up for the year? You know, it it, it can be a tough business. Uh, and, you know, it's a lot of work and so on. And we just said the risks aren't, aren't worth it. Uh, and I'm glad we stayed with it. What would, we, we would made commitments to people who are already here. We had commitments to people who wanted to come here. And to be honest, it's been an inspiring summer so far. But your question was, what would we have done differently? To be honest, I don't know. I, you know, we, we are you know, I, sometimes I feel I'm the luckiest guy in the world because I got to farm when I was a kid and I'm getting to farm uh, as I'm older and we've been lucky enough to have the the resources to, 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 to put this place together. Uh, I only wish we had uh, had really focused on our outreach, if you will, educating uh, of people sooner in the experiment, if you will, or in the, in the process, because this is becoming one of the most rewarding things that we do, is to see some of the people who come here and work here and go on to other mm -hmm. things are all benefiting greatly from that. And this, this in fact, is, is probably the most rewarding. That's wonderful. And by the way, my brother works for Bank Parabar in London. Oh my gosh! You should <laughs> and call me. Yeah. The whole world. You should have to call me. Does anybody else have a question they want to throw at David? I have a question, uh, Zay. Uh, there's a lot of pieces to your business. Uh, how many people does it take to uh, to run it? How many employees do you have? We have a full-time cheesemaker, a full-time farmer. And we've hired for the summer another apprentice farmer and, and two interns. And along with that are Rhonda and me. And then a fellow by the name of Cal Coolidge, who you may know, who lives in Jay. His family uh, is, has farmed in this valley since the early 1800s. And he works with us pretty much full time in the summer. And frankly, he helps in all kinds of ways. So that's three or four full times and maybe four part time people. Quite operation. Um, David, it's Susan again. And I, I don't know if Jackie would like to say anything, but I'd be very interested to hear what she plans to do with the skills that she's learning from you. Jackie, the question is. Uh, they're asking you, uh, what is your, how do you see your experience and what do you plan, what do you think you could plan to do with it? I'll say also by introduction, you may not have seen this, but in the middle of your presentation, that was Jackie with her shoes. <laughs> on her, one of her very first days in her farming career. <laughs> here it is. Hi. Um, yeah, my name is Jackie. I'm one of the interns here. I got here at the beginning of May. Um, so I've been here for a little over a month now. Um, and the question was, speak to my experience about being here. Oh, what, what do you hope to gain and what do you hope, think you might be able to do with it? From being here? Um, well, being from the healthcare industry, I was very affected by the way that um, people's diet played into their health. And uh, that's something that's very important to me. And, you know, ethical, sustainable food production is really something that we need to push for our future. So I had looked for many farms around the area that were doing farming in what I feel is the right way. And uh, Asgard Farm just is so diversified and makes such good quality food that um, 
I felt very lucky to be able to come up here. Um, someday I hope to have like a homestead where I, where I have some of my own animals and uh, produce some of my own food. But really here, I'm, I'm here to learn how to, uh, to make food better, pretty much. Yeah. Thank you. That was lovely. Another one of our, <clears throat> so yeah, another one of our team has just uh, walked by because we kind of take a break after the first round of work in the morning. And uh, Emmy Zielinski, she lives across the street. She's just finishing school and is thinking about being a vet, but she's been with us for how many years, Emmy? Probably three years she's come and worked with us for the summer. And after, during her high school at Al Sable Valley and during her first couple of years of school. I, I have a question. Uh, this is Linda Flutterbach. Um, I think I saw in one of your earlier slides, you talked about uh, succession of the farm. And I'm just wondering, had you, had you packed it up as you had said, you kind of had a fleeting thought of that. Um, <laughs> could you talk a little bit about how um, your plans to keep, keep the farm going when you decide that you're, you're finished with it? That's, uh, that's really a great question. <laughs> it's a great question because it's probably the biggest challenge in farming for the last century. Um, the idea of how do you pass a farm from one generation to another, it's not a farm, it's a business. So you're really passing a business from one generation to the next. And it's something that Rhonda and I have, have thought deeply about and we're right in the middle of now. We're quite actively involved in the farm now and that's not gonna change anytime soon, but we've, we've started planning for this probably five years ago. To be quite frank, we don't have the solution today. We know that there are several ways to do that. One would be our, our daughter would become involved. She's working at High Mowing Organic Seeds now in Northeast Kingdom. But I don't know that she will or won't. Um, the other idea is the stream of young people that come through here, some who may want to think of a career longer run. And the third is, is you know, putting out a proposal to see what comes up. Ron and I will stay here because we think the mission extends beyond the farm. And we do feel a responsibility to those issues as well. But we've gotten the dairy business, the, you know, the things I talked about, we've got them operating now where we are pretty confident that it can sustain a family and a small business. And uh, if you find the people who are ready and to take that, we, uh, we're gonna be pursuing that with a lot of vigor, especially over the next, uh, couple of years you know farming is it's it, farming's not a job it's a life <laughs> I hate this you know so s some people when they come here and they they see what it is they say I like the work but I'm not sure I want the life you know <laughs> it, because it's uh and and so it will take a fairly special group of people or a couple or individual to really want to carry it on and we're optimistic that we'll find somebody <laughs> What an incredible presentation and mm. business you have. Yeah, yeah it, it, thank you, David. Uh, it's been wonderful, a fascinating presentation. I agree with uh, with Linda there. Any other questions before uh, we kept David? Uh, I know you've got a lot of work to do, so we don't want to keep it. <clears throat> I just want to thank you for producing goat uh, goat cheese because that's hard to find in goat yogurt. So I'm, I'm one of you, the, uh, the buyers of that from Green Goddess or Nari's and uh, it's hard to find. So uh, thank you for doing that. <laughs> Can I share one email that I got a week ago, just in closing, <clears throat> just to, uh, you know, I felt a little bad when we issued this challenge to say you, you've got to buy all your food from the, but I hope you'll try it. We've done it for years, Rhonda and I. Um, but I got an email last week from a very good friend and customer, and quite honestly, they're one and the same when you run a small business. Uh, but they said, we, we just finished the lunch consisting of pate de campagna from Mace Chasm Farm, a baguette from Lake Flower Cakery, a salad from Juniper Hill Farm, and a white-faced chef from your farm. 
in a Cote de Rhone. Shouldn't we have a Cote de Sable? <laughs> Anyways, it was a delight to feel like we were eating here as well or better than in France. And that's somebody that knows France better than I do. So it's a way of saying that, you know, we really have a nice asset here. You know, I've been lucky enough to travel around the world to Provence and to Loire Valley, to to uh, the Piedmont region. And, you know, it's very special. And I hope that, you know, before we're done with this, that we'll see the Adirondacks really be seen as a terroir. It's just a, a food location. Uh, I think we're almost there. But thank you all so much. I've taken a lot of your time. And, uh, and I appreciate the chance to pass our, our story. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, David. I got one question. Where yep. is this farm? In Osable Forks. I understand. I, I know where Osable Forks is, but I've never seen your farm. Do you know the when you go to Osable Forks, <clears throat> the Sheldrake Road is the old J, the North J Road turns into Sheldrake Road, which goes down to Osable Forks. So you can go to the first bridge you come to in Osable Forks and take a right and a left, or you can take the bridge in Osable Forks, the first bridge when you come into Osable Forks, take a right and a right and go right up the road. We're half a mile. Literally a half a mile from our Sable Forks. <clears throat> and when you see it, you will know you're there. You always had a, a web, I just looked at your website. This is Lori, De this is Lori Dudley. I looked at your website. Have you always sold products on your website or is that just because of COVID? To be honest, Lori, this was on our agenda for the past five years. And there was always something else to do, something more important. And when this pandemic hit and we knew that the only way we were going to survive was to and get food to people safely, we took a week and we made it. Yeah, it's great. So, and this is what you're seeing all the other farms are doing now. Go around. The websites are, you know, some are better than others. But uh, I was lucky enough, Jackie, you know, when Jackie came, uh, when Jackie came up from down she quarantined for two weeks and so she, we took it she basically worked on our site the whole time it's nice it's because of her right well as a maple syrup farmer i can speak to the fact that uh, farming is a lot of hard work yes so, you can uh thank you so much for doing what you're doing for our local community and uh, this whole effort is so important in the healthy foods and a sustainable uh, industry. We need more of it and yeah. you've become a leader in it. So thank you, David, so much. Thank you all. Thank you.